Hello, welcome to part two of week eight's lecture. So what you're seeing in front of you here is a wooden shed erected next to a home uh, of a puppet master. And we're gonna use this as an example to look at a different kind of YM performance, one that is situated firmly within a folk tradition as opposed to that of the court. Right. Um, so if in the previous lecture we've looked at the Jogjakarta court uh, and the Surakarta court as centers of patronage for a Wayang uh, tradition, uh, we're going to look at the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia now, uh, specifically at Kelantan. Here we have a folk Wayang tradition that can tell us something different about uh, what is the role of performance within a community uh, uh, amongst like the people. So um, looking at this shed, um, uh, what you see here is during the daytime, but preparations are already taking place uh, for what was about to take place at night. So in the past, a shed like this would be constructed using more impermanent materials, uh, such as uh, you know chopped up bamboo trunks tied together to form a raised dais assembled in a rather makeshift manner, serving as a stage or a pangong for the wayang or shadow puppetry performances uh, that would only be performed seasonally after the harvest and during the lull that accompanied the rainy seasons. Uh, so a puppet master or the dalang uh, uh, was a professional, not in our understanding of the term today. He never performed full time, you know, the troupe uh, him accompanied by the musicians really only came together uh, after the harvest while for the rest of the planting season like most ordinary people uh, they would be farmers uh, so today however the Wayang stage that you see here uh, is definitely made of a sturdier con construction with polished wood and now it's situated within the home compound of the Dalang himself rather than in the fields or in the open lands of the kampong. Uh, nevertheless, it retains the rather open nature of the stage, uh, which really is only screened uh, on one end, uh, uh, while uh, performers uh, and musicians uh, sit inside the shed. And, and as an audience, you could really sort of like walk around and interact with this stage as well, okay? Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the pangong itself inside would have been taken up mostly by musicians. They form an important part of the ensemble, supporting the dalang and bringing the story to life. And uh, if you've heard, uh, you know, uh, the music that, is, that accompanies uh, Kelantan's Wayang performance, it is very rather entrancing. Uh, uh, however, unlike the use of gamelan uh, and the story that was told in the Javanese court tradition, here in Kelantan, this, the principal epic uh, is not the Mahabharata, but the Ramayana. Uh, a textual literary equivalent of this in Malay would be the Hikayat Sri Rama. Okay, so what is this story about. So it's principally a love story. It's much more earlier, heartier, uh, and much more uh, romantic compared to, you know, that epic about war and conquest that Mahabharata is. Uh, you know, uh, in Hikayat Sri Rama, uh, you get a sense that there's also an attempt at a local inflection, right? Uh, in this passage that you see up on the screen, it's really a painterly description of a landscape and do note the vocabulary employed to describe the different sounds made by four different kinds of birds that would convey something that would be familiar to uh, local residents listening to this cosmic tale in the Kelantanese context. So what we have here is a passage that suggests not only a local inflection, but really transforming this landscape uh, uh, and take it out of Vedic India and situate it within a kampong atmosphere somewhere in the Malay lands, right? Uh, so uh, you have the different cries of the birds, uh, 
but also a kind of like setting that would be very familiar to uh, 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 you know the people who are actually listening and watching uh, the scene as it plays out. So it's no longer merely a translation of the Indic Ramayana, but essentially it's an offshoot of a greater tree that is this, we can think of the Ramayana tradition as a translingual tradition spanning Mindanao in the southern Philippines all the way to Kashmir in Pakistan and India border. So rather than think of the ownership of the origin of Ramayana being uh, situated in India, uh, we can think of this as a really st a, a stock tradition, a stock story that has translingual manifestation. Uh, in this sense, we can also argue uh, what uh, translations like this do is that in as much as it is the localization of something that is universal, that is considered as greater, more transcendental than uh, the nitty-gritty details or the ongoings of a kampong, it is also equally a universalization of the local. What it does, it magnifies and connects what is familiar with broader world. With, it connects what is like the now and the here with the transcendental. So, in, uh, examples of this, I think, can be seen in, um, uh, in the offerings needed to be prepared for the Bajamu ritual. So, the Bajamu is a feasting ritual. It primarily is an invitation, not to the humans, but to the spirits uh, within a particular ecology to come and partake in a ritual feast, to placate them, as well as to pray for the smooth uh, passage or conduct uh, as the performance were to take place. And typically in the Bajamu ritual, you have to prepare various types of offerings. And in these offerings, uh, among them are a number of these miniaturized uh, 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 objects, right? Uh, whether it's a form of a, a boat or a, a palace, uh, or you know, a kind of stupa-like construction made out of bamboos, or a coconut-shaped sculpture that would contain food for the spirit to feast on. These um, offerings are sculptural in the sense that they really situate the kampong within a broader uh, uh, space, right? Uh, one that connects it to the palace, it connects it to a seafaring culture, it connects it to a spirit world, it connects it to also religious dimensions uh, to uh, the uh, funerary reliquary that, uh, is, uh, that we recognize the stupa to represent. So it participates and, and therefore uh, not only is a process in which the world then is translated and made visible in the kampong context. Uh, actually though, uh, we can also say the converse is true in the way the kampong is universalized uh, and often thought of as so, uh, contrary to our conventional view of the kampong as the most primitive or reductive social unit of settlement uh, that is then often uh, thought of as being rural or remote or, or far away from any forms of contact with different parts of the world. In fact, uh, thinking critically and reflexively on folk culture actually offers us a lot of very rewarding insight on the operations of world making that doesn't only take place within a court context that everyday people also have recourse towards very cosmopolitan understanding of their place in the world. And this is typically manifested in a kind of genealogy. So a Wayang village, uh, lineage here is visualized in the Pangong that we see, uh, um, visually represented by uh, this pictorial arrangement uh, that is located within the shed 
the, the wayang shed that we saw previously uh, hung on the wall. Uh, so on, at the top of this uh, hierarchy is a puppet that is framed, and the puppet represents uh, Sang Daki Darkala, or also known as the Bantara Kala, or the son of the Bantara Kul, uh, uh, Bantara Guru, um, normally uh, also recognized as a manifestation of Shiva. Uh, and this was a puppet that was made by the late uh, Ba'awang La's guru. Later, the, the late Awang La then taught uh, the late Ba Hamza, uh, who was in the photograph here, uh, uh, who then passed on the knowledge to his son, Pa Rahim, who then inherited uh, uh, these uh, uh, set of, of photographs and puppets uh, and, and tried to visualize his connection to his forebearers uh, through this interesting genealogical arrangement that he displayed on his wall. So this knowledge on the one hand is very specific. It comes through a line and this line is one that connects the practitioner uh, to a long line that you can trace all the way back to the original guru. And normally this guru is a, a god or a, a spiritual being that teaches this knowledge and pass on this unique insight uh, 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 all the way down to the present day. Uh, and therefore, as a type of knowledge that is sacred, uh, it necessarily involves um, also the participation and the recognition uh, that the performance itself uh, do not only have uh, uh, physical audiences or human audiences. And this is where the Burjamu ritual comes into play. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, in really in the enumeration uh, or the invocation that takes place during the Bajamu ritual, as well as the you know the offerings that were sort of like placed uh, and and offered up to the spirits. The spirits are therefore invited to feast and guarantee the safety of those performing and watching the Wayang ritual. Uh, therefore, even as shadowy reflection of human drama, the capacity to animate the puppets and render the Wayang puppets lifelike. Uh, as graphic as they, they may seem to our contemporary eyes, was something that was treated with great reverence uh, because to bring something into life, uh, like animation, is not only magic but also knowledge, right? Uh, it is a knowledge that centers the Dalang at this interesting intersection between different realities, cosmic, local, otherworldly, historical, and the invocation takes the form of a litany. So typically, it begins with an Islamic prayer or du'a and also selected Quranic passages, but then it quickly shifts, in, shifts gear and moves into addressing different categories of spirits, not necessarily in a clearly defined hierarchy, but nevertheless, they are categorically distinct classes of spirits uh, and, and these would be sort of like uttered out in, in a litany form, right? Uh, so what we, have, we see here is an acknowledgement of an assembly of spirits who also make up the audience of a performance. And in fact, they are recognized as uh, residents uh, and presences that are also part of the kampong uh, ecology. So a Wayang's audience wasn't simply that small number of kampung residents who after the night prayer, the Isha prayer, the last prayer of the five uh, daily Islamic prayer, they, uh, where you know, everyone would then venture out uh, for a nighttime entertainment or storytelling. Right? Uh, you are there uh, uh, also together with uh, beings that you cannot see. A Wayang place before a universe, therefore, and in his role as an orchestrator of an event of such magnitude uh, that conveys this expansive universe, uh, that the, uh, it really what it sort of like shows is that maybe we need to take this uh, this form a bit more seriously. Uh, 
and it is a form I think uh, uh, that is closely connected to what uh, the semiotic thinker Umberto Eco calls the a list. Uh, so, uh, as suggested by this uh, uh, by Eco, you know the list uh, can be understood on formal terms uh, as an attempt to catalog, you know, the phen a phenomena on exhaustive terms, on really distinct terms. What Echo meant by the list here is that it is a kind of power that be power belonging to the poetics of description that aims to convey a sensation of sheer profusion of meaning and almost uncontrollable excess. Therefore, listing is not simply a catalog of names. It can be evocatively descriptive form pictures, variety, range, and expanse. So sure, on one hand, lists can order, control, and exclude, and limit. Uh, at the same time, uh, anyone who's gone through a really long list knows how exhaustive it is. A list conveys this idea of the etc. right? Uh, uh, one that suggests that it may continue beyond uh, its physical limit, it is a, 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 a signpost towards something that is infinite. Uh, and therefore, I think Echo saw this as really a, a feature of the list, as a type of form or genre, with all its indeterminacy and represents almost a human endeavor for immortality. Now, this is a very big claim in the sense that uh, how is that connected even to the strive towards immortality? Uh, in a way, Echo argues that the list is uh, origin of culture and uh, you know the earliest sort of forms of writing were in fact listing uh, remembering that principally uh, but what does this sort of like culture one uh, it principally it has to do with trying to make uh, the I, this abstract idea of infinity comprehensible it wants to rest and create order out of it but not of, always of, but very often. So when a human faces etern uh, infinity, what does one do? You know, we do that on a day-to-day -day level. You know, when we go to the shopping mall, we create a list, our to-do list for the day, but we also sort of like, you know, create lists to connect us to our ancestors. We create lists to connect us to culture. We create lists to make what is larger than ourselves, comprehensible. And this also helps us to then, in that way, ignore the sheer meaninglessness of everything by giving us a sense that we have this under control, right? Uh, so to master the list is therefore also known to know a thing for what is, it really is on, on this level. And we can think of the litany as fulfilling that role. It is often poetically described uh, uh, in the Malay uh, uh, worldview uh, using the concept of asal uh, uh, or the origin found in mantras used in invocations to you know spiritual build, uh, beings. Uh, so a well-known version on the East Coast survives in uh, a folk song called Ulek Mayang. I'm sure many of you have heard of this tune before, but. Uh, never really quite know what it's called or know the backstory to it. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to let you find out yourself. Uh, but uh, connecting this to, uh, you know, uh, uh, our, our, our main narrative here, uh, for the magician or the puppet master uh, to know one's origin or asal of everything and everyone really is a demonstration of his knowledge of the universe that effectively grants him the power to tell story and to take those stories to shape realities on different levels. So this power comes from knowing uh, what is called the trunk story, the Jirita Pohon, which is really the main story, the, the central ingredient to make, that makes Ramayana Ramayana. If you take away Rama and Sita's love story and the abduction of Sita from this uh, uh, from the Ramayana, it's no longer the Ramayana because these are the core ingredients that make up the story. And then there are the other things, uh, embellishment, uh, uh, different kinds of like yearning uh, that grows out of this chunk. 
uh, and these are the branch stories or the ranting or the chirita ranting uh, from which uh, it emerges from the trunk. If a wayang performance may at times be said to reflect uh, you know, contemporary issues or it can be sort of like, you know, it's a political commentary and people like to sort of like say things like that, it doesn't do so in the way we understand, uh, the way we normally understand it uh, when we frame the wayang as an allegorical medium in the convention of say, Western theatre or literary discourse. Uh, one could perhaps instead entertain the idea that it is political because the knowledge system really is one that is centered on how uh, uh, this knowledge has the capacity to shape reality and persuade the many different audiences of the wayang of this reality uh, uh, through its very sophisticated language of enchantment. Uh, and this perhaps um, like respond better and help us to clarify and understanding what is the potency of this particular form within the Malay world. Uh, so part of it has to do with um, a kind of uh, worldview that really sees the environment uh, divided uh, along tripartite lines. So rather than a strict binary division uh, between land and sea, nature and culture. I think uh, uh, scholars have also argued uh, that uh, the Malay conception of the world is tripartite in the sense that uh, you would have a jungle water configuration triangulated with an earth jungle tri uh, configuration with an earth water configuration. And these three different configurations therefore uh, constitute the kind of very dynamic uh, cultural trust. And scholars like Endercott who studies uh, Malay magic uh, would even argue that it is because of this tripartite schema as opposed to a binary schema uh, it, it renders like Malay culture so much more dynamic in its capacity to uh, absorb and amalgamate uh, external cultural influences uh, in order to reproduce and, uh, and reshape it according to its own sort of like logic and terms. And I think those uh, perhaps more theoretical discussion on what we think about culture uh, takes place at the level of maybe intellectual discourse, but at its most concrete level, it is also expressed through very uh, visible kinds of manifestation in the visual culture and the performing culture uh, of the Malay world. You know, the Burjamu, the Burjamu ritual in the Wayang uh, Kulit performances of Kelantan is one example of how this dynamism is manifested. Uh, so we'll uh, look at uh, more in the subsequent lecture.